Hello, everyone. What a blessing it is to um, be here with you all on this Sabbath afternoon as the sun is getting ready to set here on the first day of May. We are moving on in this month. I tell you what, we praise the Lord. Here we are in the month of May. And hopefully you all have had a wonderful Sabbath day. Hopefully you've gotten some good, you know, some, some good rest and uh, you're refreshed. Your bodies are uh, revitalized and you're ready to actually get ready to go into a new week. And uh, I tell you what, friends, uh, we've got a great uh, revival coming up. So we want you all to actually be a part of it. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit and creation on tomorrow. And so we want you to tune in the Holy Spirit and creation on tomorrow at seven o'clock. And I believe by the grace of God that it's going to be a blessing. So we want you to tune in and uh, be blessed by the message. Be blessed by the message. We're going to have some a season. It's going to be about prayer. This is about prayer. We're asking for the Holy Spirit to fall upon our church body. And I believe that God is going to do something spectacular. So we invite you to please tune in tomorrow, tell other people about it, and receive a special blessing as we worship together. And that is on tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night at, uh, at seven o'clock. I believe by the grace of God, we're going to see a, a mighty move of God. Uh, through the program. You know, tonight we are getting ready to close out the Sabbath. Um, but before we go uh, back to uh, into a new, new week, it's always good to end on a high. It's always good to end on a high. And uh, so we're going to actually just bow our heads in prayer. And then we're going to get straight into the word of God for tonight. And we're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to do something spectacular. Father, we thank you for all your many blessings, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you, dear God, for your love and sending your son, Jesus Christ, down the cross for our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. Tonight, Lord, as we uh, hear your word, we're praying for the Holy Spirit to let your hearts and minds transform us, reshape us, and make us, and have your way. And, and be with each and every person who's tuned in. Be with people, especially in India, Lord, who now are really getting hit by this coronavirus. Have mercy upon those people over there. We remember some even here who are still getting hit, Lord. It's, it hasn't died down completely in America. Yes, it's not as prevalent as it was, but we're praying for your mercies upon the people here as well as abroad who are still suffering from this terrible, terrible uh, virus. Have mercy upon them, oh God. Be with us now. And, and, and do something spectacular here today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we want you to hear this word from the Lord. I believe you're going to be blessed. One of my favorite preachers is this gentleman right here. And he is a man of God. I actually got a chance to go to school with him. And uh, from the time I went to school with him there at Oakwood College, in Huntsville, Alabama. He's always been a consistent Christian, a young man that loves the Lord, and he loves people, and that's why God has blessed his ministry, and I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. So without any further ado, I want you to hear this word through his manservant tonight. May God bless you as we worship the Lord together tonight in spirit and in truth. Hear this word.
Hosanna, Hosanna, oh, Hosanna, in the highest, in the highest, when you say, let our King, Sing Hosanna, come on, let's go. Hosanna. Your song, beautiful. Sing. In the heart. We serve an awesome God. Every day, He's the same yesterday and forever. Come on. Let our King be lifted up. Say Hosanna. Hosanna. Oh, yes, we're going to take it up and sing that one more time. It is a blessing for me to be back here with you at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Feels like just a few weeks ago that I was here. I think it was back in November. And I was saying last night, your faces are still fresh in my mind. I can see where you sat last time. Some of you are in the same place today. And, uh, and it's good to be back with you. I thank God for your pastor. Can you say amen for him? It is always a blessing to have God-inspired, strong leadership. And sometimes we don't miss good leadership until it's gone. And so while we have it, we should thank God for it. Can you say amen? 
and uh, our prayers are with you, Sister Manders. My trip doesn't quite feel the same because you're not here, uh, but we look forward to seeing you next time. I, um, I'm glad just for an opportunity to share God's word on last night. Uh, we just kind of wanted to share a message of hope for those that have been knocked down. And we look in the book of Joshua chapter 8 and we find out that with God, this day might be different. And I just want to encourage somebody that's had a difficult last week or a difficult yesterday. I need you to know that with God, today might be different. And then early this morning, the, the faithful few came on out as we talked a little bit about the Holy Ghost. Amen. And uh, how we can be greater in field, greater, more greatly infilled with the power of the spirit. And we can be greater, greater witnesses for God's name. And then this afternoon, we want to just talk on a number of things. And so I'm going to ask you to go with me, if you will, to the book of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 34. Mark chapter 4 and verse 34. I want to talk about a battery of things from the word of God. And then we'll, we'll sit on down. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 34. When you have it, just say amen. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 34. And I can see some of you all are a little tired from sitting for a little while. Do me a favor. Take your right hand, put it on your neighbor's shoulder, squeeze them on the shoulder and wake them up a little bit today. Wake them up a little bit. All right. Say, I rebuke the sleep demon. Say, I rebuke the hungry demon. There you go. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Mark chapter four. Y'all look ready now. We look ready. Mark chapter four. And again, verse number 34. When you have it. Amen. The Bible says, Jesus was kind of in the middle of a dialogue. And the Bible says, but without a parable, and I'm preaching from the King James Version, uh, for those who want to follow along with the King James Version today. But the Bible says, but without a parable, spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. You get some things from Jesus by yourself that you don't get when everybody's around. And the Bible says in verse 35 that the same day when even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and waves that beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Today, saints, I just want to talk for a little while under the subject, the necessity of storms. The necessity of storms. Let us pray together. Father God, we are so grateful and thankful for this day that you have made. And indeed, we will rejoice and be glad in it. But Father, we, we need a very special revelation from you today. And so Lord, I pray that in the hearing of the word, that faith will be multiplied exponentially. That clarity would be given about their present circumstance. And so Father, I ask that you would hide me in the shadows of the cross. That Jesus alone might be seen. That Christ alone might be heard and that Jesus would receive exclusive praise. And so, Lord, in this moment, moment, may the kingdom of darkness be enhanced. May the kingdom, kingdom of light be enhanced and may the kingdom of darkness be diminished. Bless your people is our prayer. In the matchless name of Jesus, let them that believe say together, amen and amen. I'm not a person with a whole lot of phobias or anxieties. But one of the things I must shamedly admit is that as I've grown a little older, I've become a little bit apprehensive 
about hostile or volatile weather storms. Um, having grown up in Florida where powerful hurricanes would rake the panhandle area where I lived, and after pastoring in Mississippi and in Huntsville where tornadoes suddenly dropped from the sky, in fact, last year, one less than a mile away from my home, I've become a little bit more conscious of the elements than I should be. So whenever I am out and I begin to see the clouds drop low and mushroom into blackness, I begin to pray inwardly and make my way to safe dwelling. But my, my fear of tornadoes is heightened by my fascination with a particular show on the Weather Channel entitled Storm Chasers. Uh, maybe you've seen it. It is where photographers or scientists or adrenaline junkies, they go to a part of the Midwestern United States called the Tornado Alley so they can take pictures and witness the power of these storms. And I remember as I was watching one particular episode, the team was being led by an experienced tracker. This scientist was very experienced, yet he was a devout atheist, one who did not believe believe in God. And as the episode continued, he began to boast in the sophistication of his Doppler technology and how they could determine where the storms were going to land and exactly which way they were going to go. He would begin to boast in his superior driving skills and how his great driving had permitted him to elude danger on a number of occasions. He began to boast that there was no divine pattern in the earth and that these storms was simply a byproduct of ecology and that they could be explained scientifically. And as the episode continued, he was able to predict where a storm was going to land and it landed exactly where he said it was going to be. But the tornado that the Doppler said was going to go in one direction made an unpredictable turn back to where, where, where he was stationed at the time. And a strong gust of wind blew a foreign object in front of him his truck, pinning him between the object and the house against which he was parked. And in that moment, when the tornado began to head his direction, there was a time where there was nothing his technology could do to aid him, and his driving skills were rendered useless. And in that moment, with a cyclone of death barreling down on him and his life flashing before his eyes, he began to call on that name he so often denied, my God, my God, Jesus. Jesus, he declared. And in that moment, when he began to call on the name of the Lord, all of a sudden that cyclone of death began to suddenly get lifted up from the air. And it's an amazing thing how after the storm had passed and he got his wits about him, humiliated and embarrassed, they asked him what happened that day. And he said, I don't know what happened, but he said, somebody up there was looking after me. And let me suggest, beloved, that there is a God you can't see with your eyes. You can't hear with your ears. But can somebody testify he's still looking after us? Are you with me today? And the funny thing is that before we were saved, we would have said we got lucky. But now we know it's because the Lord was on our side. In fact, the only reason some of us walked away from the car accident was because God had his hand upon you. The reason you got up off of the operating table was not the morphine, but it was because there's still a bomb in Gilead. There's still a physician there. The only reason we didn't overdose when we were out in the world was not because we were lucky, but because the mercy of the Lord said not so. How many of us know that luck ain't got nothing to do with it? Serendipity is not at play. It's not because you got a rabbit's foot in your corner, you eat black eyed peas on New Year's, it's not because you got something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue, it's because the hand of the Lord is on his children, can the redeemed say amen. 
And see, herein, every now and then, lies the necessity of a storm. You see, like the man in the story, we need to go through some stuff that our self-sufficiency cannot conquer. Can you say amen? Every now and then, you've got to go through some stuff where money cannot buy it, and education cannot secure it, and getting married cannot fulfill it, and experience ain't never seen it. And we've got to come to that place where we realize that our only help is in Jesus. Can you say amen? And so go back with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 4 and verse number 35. The Bible says, and the same day when even was come, that he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And the Bible says, and when he had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was into the ship. Now, I want to operate this way for a little bit. I want to talk about the reasons we sometimes have storms, especially in our homes and in our families. Then I want to talk about how we wind up in certain storms storms unnecessarily, then I want to make a case for this being the greatest miracle in the scripture. Are y'all with me today? Now understand that the Sea of Galilee was known in particular for volatile elements and hostile weather suddenly. And the reason the weather on the Sea of Galilee would be so hostile is because you had opposing elements in small quarters. In other words, when you got to the Sea of Galilee, the water was about 600 feet below sea level and the mountains that surrounded it would be thousands of feet above sea level so that when the cold air from the water begin to mix with the warm air from the mountains, it would create an unstable or volatile situation. So that when the high altitude met low altitude, when cold air met warm air, it would create an unstable situation. And see, beloved, it shows us the danger of being unequally yoked in our families. Because when you have somebody up here for God, mixing with someone down here, for God and someone that is hot for God mixing with somebody that is cold for God it creates an unstable situation can you say amen today and understand beloved that when we are unequally yoked it creates a scenario where there is an ongoing tension in our homes and somebody has to make a concession in order for peace to may ensue and that's why 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14 says that we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In fact, the apostle says it this way, what fellowship is there with light and darkness? What communion is there between Christ and Belial? And what fellowship is there between Christ and an idol? Amos says it this way, that the two cannot walk together unless they be what? Agree. And when husband and wife or parent and child are in different places spiritually, you're going to have an unstable environment or somebody listening to me today. And that's why every woman that loves God and every man who is the head of the home has to at some point be able to declare like Joshua, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Am I preaching to anybody today? I see the problem is when you're unequally yoked, there is such an ongoing tension that at some point somebody's going to have to accept Christ or the other will have to accept Satan in order for there to be harmony in the home. And the reason sometimes we get unequally yoked is sometimes in our single life, I wish some of my singles are with me today, that sometimes a brother will get unequally yoked because he is so blinded by the beauty in the woman he is pursuing. But how many of us know that beauty can be deceitful? Come on and say amen. In other words, I had a member tell me this way. She says, handsome won't pay the bills and pretty won't cook a meal. Come on and say amen today. In other words, beloved, if you, if your woman, all she has is beauty, it will not last. A woman who is pretty only is like an onion. You peel back the layers and she'll make you cry. Are y'all with me in this room today? In other words, brother, you're not just going to need somebody that good, looks good on the outside. You need a woman that's full of the Holy Ghost. You need a woman that can get a prayer through. You need a woman that is able to stand by your side in trouble and encourage you that God can make a way. Are y'all with me today? Sometimes our sisters get unequally yoked because they just get tired of waiting. 
And this is the thing. You're just tired of being the bridesmaid, always tired of being the maid of honor. Let me suggest that it's better to be a bridesmaid 10 times and a bride once than to be a bride 15 times. Are y'all with me today? In other words, you're going to need somebody that's just, you don't want to settle. You don't want to just go with who's there. I need you to know you can do bad all by yourself. Are you with me today? At some point, you're going to want somebody that does more than look good. You're going to want a prophet, a priest, and a provider. You're going to want somebody that can go into the presence of God, get a revelation, and bring it back to you and your kids. You need somebody that has a living connection with Jesus Christ. Are you with me today? The second reason I believe that this storm in particular takes place is found in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 24. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Matthew gives us a little bit more insight about what happens here on this particular storm. Matthew 8 and verse 24 from the King James Version. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. In so much that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. The second reason for storms is found here. Now, notice what Matthew says. The Bible doesn't say that there arose a great tempest on the sea. The Bible says that there arose a great tempest in the sea. The reason that is interesting is because the word tempest in the Greek is not a word that means windstorm. In the Greek, the word tempest is actually the word seismos, which doesn't mean thunderstorm. It actually means earthquake. Notice now that there is no rain recorded in this gospel because the storm does not come from above. The storm comes from underneath. That's why these experienced fishermen could not see it coming. Are y'all with me today? You see, whenever there was a tsunami or a tidal wave, it is because things were unstable beneath the earth's surface. And because things were unstable beneath the surface, then the elements would act out violently without warning. And even though this storm seems to appear out of nowhere, it's been brewing beneath the surface for a long time. What I want to suggest is that there are certain things that happen in our lives that seem as if they have come out of nowhere when in fact they've been brewing beneath the surface for a long time. It may look like all of a sudden your kids just went crazy and decided to use drugs or have sex, but understand there's been some low self-esteem and bullying that's been brewing beneath the surface for a long time. It may look as if all of a sudden your husband has become bitter and indifferent, but he's been holding on to some resentment and stress that's been brewing beneath the surface for a long time. It may look as if your wife has all of a sudden lost a hope in life and a desire to keep herself up when in fact there is a spirit of depression that has been brewing beneath the surface for a long time. It may seem as if people have all of a sudden turned on you, but there's been some unresolved issues that have been brewing beneath the surface for a long time. And see, this is the necessity of the storm because sometimes in the storm, God allows somebody to act out violently so that you can see what's been brewing beneath the surface. And see, this is why, beloved, it is important that as we deal with the issues we face in life, that we don't just focus on the outward behavior, but we ask God for wisdom and direction so that we can minister to what has been brewing beneath the surface. Can somebody say amen? And see, and that's why, parents, what your daughter needs is not a longer skirt or birth control pills. What she needs is an infusion of self-esteem. How many of them know that when her self-esteem goes up, her skirt? length is going to come down. In other words, what your husband needs is not necessarily just to blow off some steam. He needs a quiet place where he can express his fears without the fear of rejection or correction. What your wife needs is more of on your undivided time and your undivided attention. Somebody that is going to pray with her and lead her in the path of righteousness. But see, this is the problem in the church. We are so image conscious and we are so aware of what people are going to think that we only want to focus on the symptoms, that which is visible, and we never want to get beneath and deal with the root of the issue. Are you with me today? 
In other words, we're so concerned about what people are going to think, what our image is going to look like, what we project. But see, I'm just kind of grown to this place where I'm not really worried about what nobody has to think. Are you hearing me today? In other words, I ain't trying to focus on those symptoms. I need the healing balm of Christ to be applied to the broken areas of my life. I'm not worried about image. I need right character. And there are some of us that are going to go to hell because we worry more about what people are going to say than we are about what God truly knows. And God is saying, you got to come to a place where you're less concerned with your image and less concerned with what people think and more concerned with getting the healing touch of Jesus Christ in your life. It's funny, man. One of the things that makes my wife a little bit upset with me is uh, she gets mad because she says, I don't really take good care of my skin. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a dark brother. So, you know, when I'm ashy, it shows. Come on and say amen to that. And one of the reasons she gets mad is because I don't just take uh, lotion and put it all over my chest and my back. I really just put lotion on my hands, on my face, and when I'm wearing shorts from my knee all the way down, I only want the oil on the parts that people are going to see. And see, that's the way some of us approach our Christianity. We only want the oil of anointing on what people can see. And God is saying, you don't just need to have the visible anointing. You need the anointing in your heart. You need the anointing in your soul. You need to have a baptism and a transformation inwardly, and the outside is going to follow. Let the redeemed say amen. And so go back with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 4. We're going to go a little deeper in this thing. Y'all don't mind staying in the Bible today, do you? Mark chapter 4 and verse number 35. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Mark chapter 4, actually in verse 34. Listen to what Jesus says. He simply says, in verse 35, let us go over to the other side. Now, this is one of the things you got to understand about Jesus, is that Jesus always moves with a mission he is always moving with a purpose. So that when Jesus says, let's go to the other side, the first question you ought to ask yourself is, what is waiting on the other side? So go with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says that they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met, a, met him a man out of the tombs that had an unclean spirit. Now, we're getting a little deeper in this thing because as they come over to the other side, they don't just uh, go to the place of the Gadarenes, but the Bible lets us know that there is a man there who is full of an unclean spirit that needs to be delivered by Jesus Christ. But this is what you've got to know about this storm. Ellen White says that during this storm, the disciples are overtaken. They are fighting a satanic fury in this storm. And what has happened is that the demons inside of this man are able to sense that Jesus is coming. And so they think to themselves, last time we saw him, this didn't work out so well for us. And so what they do is they dispatch a special entourage of demons to try to shake the earth and create such volatility on the sea so that they can drown Jesus and the disciples. And so the purpose of the storm is twofold. It is to keep the disciples from seeing the miracle and it is keeping the man from receiving his miracle. In other words, church, the purpose of this storm is to prevent this man from receiving the delivering power of Jesus Christ. The reason the disciples or the church is shaking up is so that this man will not receive Jesus as he needs to. And see, this is why our churches are going to go through certain storms. The reason our churches will go through certain storms and the reason the devil is going to create certain drama and certain fragments and certain sections and certain types of foolishness in the church is if he can get us so caught up in our storms, we will never ever reach those that need the healing touch of Jesus Christ. Are we aware in this church that nothing in this church is about you? It's not about how many generations you got in the church. 
It is not about the church office that you hold. It is not about the title that's behind your name. It is not about the degrees that you have on your wall. The purpose of the church is so that we can reach lost men and lost women with the good news of Jesus Christ. And whenever we find ourselves fighting against each other and embroiled in drama, it ought to awaken our sensibilities that there is somebody on the other side that needs what only we have. And whenever we lose our focus, because there's somebody that goes without Jesus Christ. And it's funny because this man is in a place where he can just sense something special happening in the air. But the devils begin to move with more force and more power because they want to keep this man from receiving his deliverance. You see, understand that the storm says to this man that help is on the way. You see, every now and then, I don't know if you've ever been to that place in your life where you ask God to do something inside of you. And, and it hasn't happened completely, but you can see sin beginning to lose its hold. Am I preaching to anybody today? Where, where you got to that point where you ain't free yet, but you can feel sin losing its grip. Where, where you're at that place in your life where it hadn't happened, but you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're at that place where, like the Baptists say, you can heal, feel your help coming on. And understand that when you're on the verge of being delivered, the devil's threat level is going to go higher. And what's going to happen is he's going to throw waves and waves and waves of trouble at you. But understand that the waves of trouble don't mean that it's time to give up. The waves of trouble mean that it's it's simply time to drop your anchor and hold on to Christ. The storm is simply a symbol that help is on the way. It is an encouragement to hold on to your faith because Jesus is about to come through. Are you with me today? So check this out. So they find up in a storm unnecessarily for a number of reasons. The Bible says in verse number 36, check this thing out. This thing just keeps getting gooder and gooder to me. I know I shouldn't say that. It says, they sent away the multitude and they took him even as he was into the ship. Now, the reason they wind up in this storm unnecessarily is because they compartmentalize the lordship of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what the Bible says? The Bible says they took him even as he was into the ship. What that has to deal with is the way they are relating to Jesus Christ. Now you got to see this thing where, where as they begin to get down in the boat, they escort Jesus down into the boat, they place him in the back at the stern, and then they take the helm themselves. In other words, they are relating to Jesus as a passenger and not the captain of the boat. In other words, the issue here in this story is their desire to have equality with God. And so I see this thing in my mind's eye where, where they come, they escort Jesus in the back of the boat, and they sit him down. And I can kind of see Jesus sitting in the back of this boat, kind of waiting to be consulted. I can see him in the back of the boat waiting for somebody to ask him for instruction. But nobody makes any requests. Everybody acts as if they know what they should be doing. And it's a funny thing where I can see in my mind's eye where Jesus comes up and says, listen, guys, maybe we ought to go this direction because if we go this way, we may run into a little something. And I can see Peter waving him off saying, Lord, Lord, we, we've been this way before. Go on and sit back down. And I, and I can see him kind of getting back up again and coming and saying, listen, guys, if we go the way we normally roll, we're going to run into something. Maybe we need to consider an alternative route. And they say, no, Jesus, go and just sit back down. We, we, we got this. And, and I can see him coming a third time and saying, listen, guys, uh, I'm, I, I see something. You know, God is showing me that we're going to run into a little something and we keep going. And I can see them waving him off a third time. And so then Jesus now goes to the stern of the boat, sits down lays his head on a pillow and goes to sleep not because he is indifferent or unconcerned but it is clear that his guidance is not needed maybe Jesus is asleep in your life not because he doesn't care but because he's gone so long without being consulted so check this out See, what you got to understand is the mind of a disciple. See, at this point, they still don't really know how to deal with him. They don't really know how to relate to Christ at this point. And so as a result, they kind of compartmentalize their, his lordship. In other words, these are experienced fishermen. 
In other words, they, and they're thinking, he ain't nothing but a carpenter. So he can tell us what to do in the carpenter shop, but we know what to do on the water. He can tell us what to do in the temple, but we're the experts here on the sea. He can tell us kind of what to do in spiritual things, but when it comes down to navigating the terrain of the sea, we got this on our own. And what they do is they reduce his lordship to very small sections of their lives. They don't let his lordship cross over into every part of their interaction with him. And the fact is, beloved, that we compartmentalize the lordship in the same lordship of Christ in the same way. Many of us say, Lord, you can kind of tell us how to talk on the Sabbath day, but don't tell us how to talk on Tuesday afternoon. You see, some of us are like, Lord, you can tell me how to dress in church, but don't tell me how to dress when I'm on my own time. Lord, you can tell me what to do with the 10 percent, but don't try to tell me what to do with the 90 percent. You can tell me how to represent myself when I'm on duty at church, but don't try to tell me how to represent myself when I'm on Facebook. The Lord, you can kind of contain it here, but we try to exercise autonomy over here. And what I'm saying to the church of the living God is that we've got to reach a point in our experience where Jesus Christ is not just Lord of the Sabbath, but he's Lord of Tuesday. He's Lord of Wednesday. He's Lord of our pocketbooks. He's Lord of our relationships. He's Lord of our marriages. He's Lord of our children. We've got to let him become Lord of every portion of our lives. Can you say amen? You see, the next reason they kind of wind up in this storm unnecessarily is because they are seduced by the calm that takes place before the storm. You see, you know, in this storm, there is no, there is no rain. There are no storm clouds that have gathered. There is a relative calm. There is a mild wind gust. There is no obvious signs of danger. Even when there is a tornado or a hurricane where I live, those great storms are usually preceded by a period of very nice or mild calm just before the storm. And see, there are a number of implications for us because the fact is that we are living in a time of relative peace. We're living in a time where we don't see certain apocalyptic things taking place in very visible and obvious ways. And because there are not outward signs of the apocalypse, some of us begin to kind of get deceived by the relative calm of before the storm. But that's why John in Revelation 7 says, listen, I see four angels standing at the four corners of the earth and they've been given the command to hold back the winds and hurt not the earth or the sea until the people of God have been sealed. Oh, this thing makes me shout today. The only reason that the winds have yet to be released is not because they won't be. It is simply God's mercy giving us a chance while the door of probation is still open to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's is why the Bible says God is not slack. As men, some men count slackness, but God is long-suffering, not willing that all should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it's funny because there are times where we say, man, Jesus should have came 50 years ago, or Jesus should have came 20 years ago, or Jesus should have come 10 years ago. But I Thank God that he didn't come 20 years ago because 20 years ago, I wasn't in the church. 10 years ago, I wasn't in the faith. Five years ago, I wasn't in covenant. If he had come last night, some of us would have been in trouble. Some of us ought to just lift hands and say, Lord, I thank you that you held the door open long enough so that I could get in the ark of safety. Are you with me today? And understand, beloved, that we've kind of gotten to a point where we have gotten deceived by the calm before the storm. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Y'all don't mind studying the Bible for a little bit today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 2. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 2. When you get there, let me hear you say amen real good. The Bible says, For you yourselves know perfectly that a day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as the travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not the of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let the redeemed say amen today. What the Bible is trying to let us know is that just because we are in a peace, a period of peace, it does not mean that peace will always prevail. Is there anybody that's aware that even though politicians say it's going to get better and we're going to usher you into a better tomorrow, how many of us know that things are not going to get better but they're going to get worse? And that the prophet of God says that the last movements are going to be sudden movements. And it's going to go from being a very tranquil world to being a world that is turned upside down by the fury and the anger of God. And what God is trying to say to his people is that we ought not lose our awareness, that we ought not sleep as the world does. In fact, Romans says that it is high time that we awake out of sleep for our salvation is nearer than when we have believed. And see, the funny thing about this thing, man, is see, we see we get comfortable with these kind of periods of laxity and lukewarmness. I may have shared this story with you. I remember one time, you know, when I was growing up, before my family accepted the truth, you know, one of the things we used to love to eat is we used to love to eat crabs. And um, not just crabs, but, but live crabs. And so what would happen is my mom would put a big pot of boiling hot water on the stove. And, and we made the mistake of trying to put these crabs down into a big cauldron of boiling hot water. And what would happen is when they could feel the steam or the heat rising from the pot, they would begin to scramble and they would try to jump. And some, when they they hit the water, they would pop out, and if they got on the floor, you would have a hard time getting that brother back inside of the pot. So what we begin to do after a while is we stop boiling the water on the stove, and we would just put a lukewarm pot of water on the stove. And what would happen is once they got in the lukewarm water, they wouldn't fight, they wouldn't scamper, they would go inside of the lukewarm voluntarily. And once they got in lukewarm, they would sit there and get comfortable. And we wouldn't go from zero to brawl at all at once, but we would just turn up the heat a little bit at a time. And they made adjustments from lukewarm to warm, from warm to hot. And before they knew it, they were dinner on our plate. And what the devil's going to do at the end of time is he's going to try to hide the heat. He's going to attack us with lukewarmness because we voluntarily agree with lukewarmness. We sit in lukewarmness without a fight. We don't see any threat, but he's just going to turn up the heat until we can't take it no more. Are you hearing the word of God today? And it's a powerful thing, beloved. Where they're in this place where, where you know, this is the funny thing about it, that once this storm goes on, Ellen White says, they don't wake Jesus up right away. In other words, they, they take their buckets and they try to empty the water out and they try to keep the ship steady and they try to manage the situation. And the funny thing about it is you would think that if this storm was so great that they would wake, wake Jesus up right away. But the issue is they try to do it all by themselves. And guess what? When they can't do it by themselves, then they want to say, Lord, don't you care whether we live or die? And see, this is the thing about it. Jesus stands up rebukes the wind, rebukes the waves, and says, peace, be still. Now, this is the thing about God. God was able to stop the storm at any point. But Jesus waits until their strength is all gone before he does anything, because if he moves while they're still moving, then somehow they'll take the credit. And somebody's got to understand that sometimes God won't move his hand until you take your hand off of the wheel so that it is clear that it's not by might or by power, but it is the hand of the Lord that brought it to pass. As I remember growing up, you know, I remember my dad took me out to uh, lift weights for the first time. And uh, <laughs> I remember my first day out there lifting weights. You know, we, we, he put like 125 on, on, the, on the barbell. And, you know, I lifted up one time and two times and three times. And I got to like seven times. And when I got to like number seven, what he did was he reached down and he gave me what they call a spot. 
And he gave me a spot so that I was able to get to eight, number nine, and number 10. And the funny thing is, like, when you're young, you get really full of yourself really easy. And so I remember the next couple of days, I was walking around the house with my shirt off, always flexing in the mirror, calling my friends, talking about how I did 125 10 times on my first time out. And so what happens is my dad just gets tired of my boasting. So the next time we go out and he lets me lift the bar by myself, I get to number six and I get to number seven. But when I get to seven, no spot comes this time. And so I'm able to get it up to number seven, and I'm able to get it up to number eight. And when I get to about eight and a half, a barbell just comes crashing down on my chest. And what he does is he doesn't give me a spot until I can't handle it anymore, because if he moves while I'm still moving, I'm going to think that I'm the one that did it. So he waits till my strength is all gone to lift it so that it becomes clear that just because my hands are on it doesn't mean that my father wasn't lifting lifting it for me. And how many of us know that God gives us a divine spot every now and then? It may look like your hand is on it, but it is the hand of the Lord that's lifting what you cannot bear all by yourself. See, this is the thing you got to understand about God. When we work, just like in a boat, when you're still working, God rests. But when you let God work, you can rest. You just got to let him do it on your behalf. And so, listen, they finally get so tired, so worn out, so exhausted, can't handle it, that they finally give up and say, Jesus, don't you care? Now, this is why, just for my money, I believe that this is the greatest miracle in the Bible. Some would disagree, but it's why I believe this is the greatest miracle in the Bible when they give up, and they say, Lord, you do it, and he rebukes the sea. Now, I can't wait to get to heaven. How about you? And one of the things I look forward to in heaven is every now and then down here on earth, we have a good testimony service. But I believe we ain't seen no testimony services till we get to heaven. And so in my mind's eye, I can kind of see us hanging down by the tree of life. And every now and then, all the old patriarchs will kind of gather around the front of the tree. And we'll all kind of sit around and just listen to them talk about the great things that God has done. And I can see us sitting around that tree and old Abraham standing up and saying, I got a testimony. And I can see Abraham looking Moses in the eye and says, there was a time where I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do, but I stepped out on faith, and the hand of God was able to provide in such a way that God not only blessed me, but he blessed my children and my children's children throughout the generations. But then I can see Noah standing up and saying, hold up, Abraham. I was there, and I preached all those years, all by myself. And I didn't see a cloud in the sky. And I was inside of the ark where God made it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the strong hand of God was able to deliver us. And God was able to bring us out and preserve a new line and a new covenant. But then I can see Moses standing up in that thing. And he can't hardly hold his peace. And he says, listen, fellas, let me talk about what God has done for me. Listen, I was in Egypt when God told me to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And they began to harden their hearts toward God. And God sent ten gruesome plagues upon the land of Egypt before they let us go. And when we walked out of the Egypt, we didn't go empty-handed, but we took the silver and gold and the fine linen. And when we got down by the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army was behind us, and the mountains were on both sides. But then the Lord just stepped down in the Red Sea and the walls opened up and we walked through on dry ground. I was there when God made water come from a rock and I was there when God made manna come from heaven. You can't tell me about what the Lord has done for me. Then Joshua's going to stand up in that thing and say, Moses, you got us halfway there but you couldn't get us all the way in. Let me tell you, Moses, about how God opened up the Red Sea. Let me talk about how when God had us march around the walls of Jericho seven times and we marched around seven times on the seventh day and on the seventh time the walls came tumbling down you ain't seen nothing Moses until you called out to God and God made the sun stand still for an entire day God has been good to me then Elijah stands up and says Joshua you had Caleb but I was all by myself with the prophet 
prophets of Baal. And I was there by myself when I prayed and I asked God to send fire down from heaven. And God sent fire and overthrew the prophets of Baal. And then all of a sudden, Daniel knocks him out of the way and says, you ain't never been in no lion's den, Elijah. I was there when I was in the lion's den all night. They thought I was going to be destroyed. But God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. And when they moved the tone, the king said, good morning. I said, how you doing, king? Because God took care of me. Then all of a sudden, the three Hebrew boys like, yo, Daniel, that's cool. But you ain't never been in a fiery furnace. Man, I was inside of the heat of the furnace. There were three men of us. We went in there bound, but all of a sudden, Jesus came in right on time, and God was able to preserve us from the fiery furnace. Then, all of a sudden, the woman with the issue of blood walks in the center of the room and says, listen, I was down to my very last dime. Didn't know how I was going to make it, but I heard Jesus kept a medicine chest in the hem of his garment, and I reached down and touched the hem of his garment, and the Bible says, immediately, my issue of blood was healed. And then blind Bartimaeus stands up in that thing and says, I hadn't seen all these years, but Jesus touched me. And then I was able to see. Then the man by the pool of Bethesda stood up and said, Lord, I was in there 38 years. There was no cure. I could never get in for the healing of the water. But Jesus didn't even touch me. He just spoke the word. And I was able to get up off of my sick bed and begin to walk. And then the man by the pool of Bethesda is knocked down because Lazarus walks in the room. And Lazarus just walks in and says, I was dead. I was dead. I was dead. My body began to sting. My skin began to rot. My spirit had already departed. But I heard the voice of Jesus calling me back home. And he raised me up from the dead. Then after a while of listening to the prophets and the patriarchs begin to testify, I believe that some of you and me will want to get in that thing and say, hold up, I've seen God make a way when there was no way. I've seen God come through right on time. And then Jesus will say, all of those were great miracles. But this was my greatest work. See, I think what we've done is we've confused what the miracle really was. The miracle is not that he calmed the sea. Oh, y'all not with me on this thing. Because water always does what Jesus tells it to do. It wasn't really a miracle that he called demons out of people. Because even demons tremble and believe. It wasn't really a miracle that he fed 5,000 because he spoke and it's done. He he speaks it and it stands fast. It's not really a miracle when he raises somebody from the dead because he has the keys of hell and death. The miracle there in Mark chapter 4 is not that he got the winds and the waves to obey. It's when he finally got these hard-headed disciples to finally give up and yield over control to Jesus Christ. Why is that the miracle? You see... The only miracle in the eyesight of God is when human beings, because see, everything else in creation does what it's told. Air does what it's told. Water does what it's told. Demons do what it's told. But the only created entity that does not obey is us. And the miracle of all the ages is when those of us who have been lost in sin, shaping in iniquity, hardened by circumstance, determined to have our own way, finally reach a point where we take our hands off the wheel and say, Lord, have thine own way. See, that's the great miracle of the Bible is when God can get those of us who have been hardened and broken by the world to finally, you said it, to surrender our wills to Jesus Christ. Are you with me today? You go ahead and play for me. You see, that is what Jesus was after in this story. He wasn't really after his own glory. It wasn't about just kind of showing out for the storm or for the sea. He's been doing that. He's the creator. The only thing that was up for grabs, the only thing that was under question was the will of the disciples. He's simply trying to get them to a point where they will finally give up Let go and let God have his way. See, that is the great miracle of the ages. The greatest miracle, the greatest miracle. We see it all the time, just don't recognize it. It is when lost people receive Jesus Christ. The great miracle of the world is that Jesus is able to look beyond our faults and see our needs. The great miracle is that he knows 
everything about us and he still loves us anyhow. The great miracle of the ages is that he has put up with us all these years, all this time, after all of our sins, and he still says, whosoever will, let him come. It's funny, we, we tend to thank God when we get the house, and we thank God when we get the car, and we thank God when we get the promotion. But I just want to suggest that the thing we ought to be the most thankful of is that we can get our iniquities blotted out. Somebody says he's the God of a second chance. I used up my second chance the same day I got out of the baptismal pool. But God is infinite in mercy. He is infinite in grace. And he has forgiven us of all of our trespasses, all of our sins. And see, and this is what makes justification so powerful. That basically because we are justified by faith and we claim his merits as our own, we are able to stand in heaven as those who never ever once sinned. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. And friends of mine, I don't know about you, God is still pursuing that same miracle. Not necessarily just to calm a storm or to open up a sea or, or to be able to make bread come from heaven or to make water from a rock. What he wants to do in our time is he wants to find hearts that are surrendered to his will, to his way, to his authority. How many of us believe the word of God today? If that's your desire today, to just surrender to your whole heart, to his will, to his way, his authority, I invite you to stand to your feet as we get ready to close today. I'm going to make two appeals. The first appeal today is for the body of Christ. For some who've surrendered compartments, who surrendered sections, who surrendered portions. To simply say, Lord, I'm opening up every door in the hallway of my heart. And I'm letting you come all the way in. I'm letting you come into every section. Letting you come into every closet. Under every carpet. I leave no thing hidden. I keep nothing off guards, but I let you come on the inside. There is this old painting. I don't know if it's traveled over here, old picture. And it is a picture of Jesus standing at a house. And it is a picture of him knocking on a door. Have you ever seen that picture? Now, if you ever pay close attention to the picture, you will notice that it does not have a doorknob on the outside of the door. Because Jesus does not force his way in. He's got to be let in from the inside. And what God is desiring for somebody today is for you to simply say, Lord, I'm tired. Can't do it on my own any further. Can't continue to try to do it my own way. But like the disciples, I'm saying, Lord, I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. And maybe there's somebody in the room today that has never really accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. You've never really embraced this grace invitation to be covered by his blood and transformed by his spirit. Maybe you, you've never really received it. You've heard about it. You've, you've heard sermons and you've, you've heard loved ones talk about it, but you've never experienced it for yourself. And today you want to simply say, Lord, I've been trying. I've tried to manage it, but now I can't manage it. I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. So I want to make that appeal for somebody who's never done it. And then I want to make that appeal for somebody who was once with God, once in the boat, but you got out of the boat. And now you need to come back home to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You want to simply say, Lord, I give you my will. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I yield it over. I hand it over to you. If that's your desire today, you want to receive Jesus Christ for the first time, you want to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to just invite you to tell your neighbor, excuse me, come down to the front, give me your hand, give Jesus Christ your heart today. If there's somebody you want to make that decision today, why don't you just come? Why don't you come? God bless you. Is there somebody else today you want to make that decision to come back home? God bless you, brother. Is there somebody else today you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to accept him as your Savior, your Lord, you embrace him as a soon coming king. Why don't you come? 